How is the church supposed to serve the people around them? That's what we're going to find out today in 1 Corinthians 4. All right, so we got done talking about how you, you have it all wrong. You say you're followers of Peter and followers of Paul, but instead they are servants of God's word, teaching us God's word. And we have everything kind of at our feet. The, the church leaders are also the church servants, and we're going to go more into that. And he says, so how should a person regard, he says, a servant of Christ? And in this case, the servant, I guess, is a word that is akin to the guy. It's the guy rowing the boat underneath the deck. It's not the worst job in the planet. It's not great. Those people got fed pretty well. They had huge responsibilities to row the boat and get the boat across whatever sea it was going through. But I mean, it wasn't the greatest job. And a steward of the mysteries of God. And a steward is more like someone who's not free. They, they are a servant of the house, but they're the manager of the house. It makes me think of Daniel when he's in Persia. You know, he is a slave in the end, but he is also the third highest person in the entire court. You know, so it's someone respected, a manager of the house, manager of the farm, someone who looks after the household. They're stewards of mysteries of God. So they're all supposed to, you know, manage them and look after them and make sure that they're told in the correct way. They're, on one hand, lowly servants, but on the other hand, they're also stewards who are taking care of the household. But it's not just that you do the right work, it's that you have to be faithful to God, that you have to be faithful to the message that they're bringing, to the to Christ in the end. It's a responsibility, not just to the people, but their first obedience is to Christ and his message. They're protecting it. They're preaching faithfully the word of God. And he says they judge him, or if other people judge him, or if he judges himself, he's not aware that he has done anything wrong, I guess, in that sense. He can be acquitted because it's God who judges him. You know, if God entrusts you with this burden to do this thing, then it's God who you're going to answer to. The vibe in this letter reminds me of a response to a complaint. You know, maybe the church of Corinth is actually not just fighting with each other, but also complaining about the work that Paul did, or maybe the other apostles have done for them too. And so he's like, you know, don't judge me before the time of the Lord comes. You know, that's where I'm going to get judged at the time of the Lord. Don't start bringing these things against me. That's why I say it sounds a little defensive or it sounds like he's, he's striking up a complaint of people against him. And they're bringing light into the darkness, things that are hidden in the darkness. And disclose this, he says, for the purpose of the heart. Remember the heart, that's what matters. He, he hopes that they learn from him, Paul and Apollos, but they don't go beyond what is written. For you can't get puffed up. And you know, you see that, right? We see that in the church today, that it's now not just a matter of following the word of God, but now we have to puff up what is being said. I was just reading kind of an expose of a fairly famous pastor who admitted in that he was going beyond what God promised because he wanted to be able to promise people wealth and health. And, and he realized it. He said, I, you know, the, the things I've said are not in the scripture. He hopes he's forgiven in the end for it. And this is what now Paul is saying, you know, don't do that. Don't go beyond what's there. Don't be puffed up, meaning don't be arrogant. It's that ego word against each other because everything they have was a gift from God. And so there's nothing to boast for. Now, again, think about Corinth again. This was a wealthy area. It was huge in trade. It had banking systems. Think of, I don't know if this is the right analogy but Harvard as Athens, the thinkers, the, the people in the ivory tower thinking the deep thoughts of the world. And maybe this is New York. This is the bustling business. People are wealthy. People have money. They have everything they need. And he's saying that you shouldn't be boastful about it. You shouldn't have an ego about it. You boast, he says, as if you didn't receive it, as if this wasn't a gift to you. This is all a gift that has been given to you. You're already rich. And, and they have everything that they want. And in fact, he says that without us, they could have been kings. They were so wealthy in this community. Everyone had enough of everything they needed. 
he knows that th- th- those apostles, these apostles that were left on earth after Christ died, that they're going to be sentenced to death. They're going to be spectacles, which means embarrassments or sideshows of the world. And people are going to mock them. Men and angels were fools for the sake of Christ, he says. But you're wise. You're strong. You have honor. You have everything that you ever need. Meanwhile, we're fools. We're weak. We are hungry. We're thirsty. We're poorly dressed. We are homeless. We work with our own hands. Remember, Paul was a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman. They were all laborers. But instead, when they are reviled, they're blessed. When they are persecuted, he says, we endure. These are good things when we're slandered, you know. And so, and he says in the end that they have been and still are scum of the earth. I mean, look at that. And refused all things. Everything that's good in this world, they're refused. And so you got to take a little bit, I guess, of sarcasm with this, that they were kings, that they were wealthy, they have everything they need, they could be sitting on thrones, they're wise and they're looked up to, and we're nothing, we're scum of the earth. And it's ironic, you know, it's, it's, he's not saying it in truth, he's saying you look at yourself as pretty, pretty high up there. I mean, imagine, again, you had a group of laborers who got a chance to meet the one and only Lord Jesus Christ while he was on earth during his time here. And they go first to Harvard and tell them they're all not really wise. And then they go to New York and say, sure, you're rich and we have nothing and we're scum of the earth. Everything that has happened to us, everything that has been done to us and the world looks us as terrible and lowly. But you know what? We're fools for Christ. We're wise in Christ, despite us being homeless and looking terrible and having nothing and being hungry and being thirsty, all even, you know, going to jail. But instead, we endure. We'll take it because that's what God called us to do. And when Paul mentions, quote, because we've become spectacles to the world, to angels and to men, the word spectacle is the idea that they are in the gladiator realm, that they are a show. They're the show that is to embarrass them, the theater, the vicious crowd who wants to see a good show, and that they're going to be brought to death. And again, all 11 are brought to death, except for John, who dies after a long imprisonment, tough life being an apostle. And chances are, when Paul is talking about the fact of these, that they're poor, they're weak, they're hungry, they're thirsty, it might be literally what is happening to Paul right now in Ephesus. He's writing the letter from Ephesus. And so it's not just a theoretical state of being. It might be his actual being that he's in right now. And we get embarrassed, you know, if we get called out at work when our faith is on the line. I have worked for two companies, but didn't think a whole lot of Christianity. Not at all. They, um, in one case, they, I'm pretty sure let go people who were Christians, people who had Bible studies in the lunchroom were let go. And in the other case, the other fellow was really quite cruel, I guess, to people who showed any signs of faith. In fact, someone had once written Bible verses on the ping pong balls in our ping pong table uh, recreation area. And the owner of the company saw that, stepped on every single one of the ping pong balls, and then ordered someone to go buy a bunch of new ping pong balls not, you know, very faithful. And the place I live doesn't think a whole lot of Christianity, doesn't think that we should even exist, debated, you know, what kinds of Bible verses we were allowed to put on the outside of the the new building we were building. We're nothing to these people. We're nothing at all. But yet instead, we do have everything because Christ has told us to go and stand up for these things. And when we're doing this, so even when the world looks like it looks at this, we're blessed. We're blessed in the end. And he says that he's writing all these things not to embarrass them, not to put them down, but because he loves them like a father. And he's been a father to them. And he's sending Timothy to help them learn how to be a little bit more like Paul. Paul's trying to be like Jesus. Why don't you be a little bit more like Paul? And so that he can help his beloved children learn more in the ways of Christ, be less arrogant, and be imitators. I saw this meme on the internet 
that shows this shows a picture of Jesus and it says Paul trying to look like Jesus and it pretty much looks like a recognizable version of Jesus and it says me trying to be like Paul and it was a stick figure with a beard doesn't look anything like him it's hard enough for us to be like Paul much less be like Jesus but we should still try and so he hopes to guide these people that he loves I, you ever th- met someone or knew someone in your childhood who had parents that never told them no, never guided them, never taught the children how to grow up and be mature or do the right things? For all the faults my dad had, he was pretty good at that. He always tried to instill a very strong moral backbone into me about the way you treat other people and how you do things in this world. There were other people that I lived on on the military base. Their parents weren't involved with them at all. Their children were cooks, uh, house cleaners. But get yourself to school, too. When you don't have parental guidance, your life goes off track. And he's saying it here. I'm doing this because I love you like a parent. When a parent tells their child they're screwing up or they're doing something wrong, it is out of love when done correctly. It is there to correct them and make them understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. And not only that, again, he's sending Timothy to help too, and he hopes to come along shortly thereafter and help as well, if it says the Lord wills. But you know what? The kingdom of God is not about people who talk about power, not about people who are arrogant. And instead, he asks them, what should I do? Should I come with a rod? You know, I'm I'm, I'm going to spank you. I'm going to hit you because I love you. Or should I come with love in the spirit of gentleness? No one was going to get hit, but Paul knows how to talk sternly, and he knows how to talk kindly. Which message do you want? And in the end, the strong message and the loving message are the same. They both come from God. We see that throughout the Bible. Strong messages, loving messages, God does it too. It's a big, strong lesson, and the people in Corinth are screwing this up because they rely so much on their well. Paul, in the end, is hoping that the people of Corinth stop this, stop this arrogance, stop this trying to be wise, trying to look great, trying to follow the right person, trying to build the right buildings, trying to do all these things. And instead, he hopes that they stop it and so that he can come there and not take them down anymore for what they're doing. Let's try this example. You have two parents, one parent who disciplines their child and the other parent just lets their child do whatever they want. Let them roam free. There are no rules, but also two kinds of kids. Those who listen to the correction or listen to the advice their parents are giving them and those kids who rebuke it and laugh at it and don't want anything to do with it. Um, You know, being a child of an alcoholic, I remember at one point my dad quit drinking and suddenly he was telling me what time I had to be home, be home by 10. Well, I've never in my life had to be home by a certain time. Can can my friend stay overnight? No. Oh, well, I've always had my friends stay overnight. I had no parenting. I could do pretty much whatever I wanted to do when I wanted it. And I recognize that this was him trying to be a parent again, that he was sober. And I would rather have him admonishing me and being sober than being drunk and ignoring me. But when I talked to other kids in Al-Anon, they were upset and angry that suddenly their parent was trying to be a parent to them and telling them what to do. And I'm not going to listen to them. So just like there's two kinds of parents, there's two kinds of children. And in the end, Paul is saying, look, I can be either way with you. And it's hard either way to admonish you with the rod or to love you when sin has entered your grip. And he's asking them, which which way should I go? So what I'm going to meditate on is this fact that our pastors, our leaders in our church really have a huge burden on them. That in one case, they are servants of God, lowly servants of God. In the other case, they are stewards of God, there to represent to us what exactly it is that needs to happen, how the church should operate, how things should go on. And they have to make tough decisions. What do you do when someone does something severely wrong? Do you forgive them or do you possibly threaten to throw them out of the church? Do you deny them communion? Do you let them have communion if there's a fight going on? I mean, there are tough, tough issues for sure. So I'm going to meditate on what a tough job it is to be servants and stewards. 
and how we should never get over our own skis with that and start thinking of ourselves wise and rich. You know, a lot of times pastors are much poorer materially than their parishioners, but, or maybe not as educated as some of the people who go to their church, but instead they are the stewards. They are wise in God's words. They are enduring in God's words. And even though they might not live the lives we do, we should never be arrogant about that. And what I'm going to pray is always for that humility and that acceptance of our pastors, of our church leaders as servants and stewards, and how that they are meant to administer this church and that we need to give them a lot of respect and a lot of prayers. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that we should not puff ourselves up based on the circumstance we are. And nor do you look at someone else based on their material goods, based on what they have, what they don't have, how they're treated. Instead, we should look at them as servants and stewards of our church and and someone who deserves a lot of respect and a lot of prayers. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend. I appreciate it. And remember, you can find all my other podcasts at abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. And if you have anything to say to me, you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. Thanks so much. Have a really great week.